Well, uh, Christian, uh, welcome to the World Energy Policy Summit. Uh, Thank you. And greetings from New Delhi. Thank you. Uh, good to see you and uh, a beautiful background you've got. I'm very familiar with Norway. So it's making me a little bit Norway sick in the sense I've not been able to visit there a couple of times. But good to, good to talk with you, and I'm very familiar with your company. Many of us are in India, thanks to your presence in Indian market. Uh, but I was this, this time I'm going to focus more on hydrogen fission. I mean, hydrogen has been around for millions of years on this planet. It's nothing new. But it looks like when I read the newspaper and media and talk with industry captains like you, uh, suddenly, all energy players have started talking of hydrogen as if it was discovered yesterday. Uh, why suddenly, you know, uh, hydrogen is such a short after uh, business? And uh, and people want, would my audience would like to know those who are not very familiar with hydrogen. What exactly is hydrogen, and why suddenly hydrogen is so hot? Hydrogen has been on this planet since uh, it was created, and it's mostly connected with oxygen into what we know as water. Uh, it's also into hydrocarbons, so it's, uh, there's a lot of hydrogen, but not in pure form. It's, co it's mainly connected to oxygen or carbon. And, and hydrogen is really the main energy content in hydrocarbons. Uh, so uh, what uh, is happening now is that uh, the world needs a lot of renewable energy to fight climate change. And uh, the easiest way to provide that energy is to produce renewable electricity. And there will be lots of it, six times more renewable electricity on this planet mid-decade than we have now. But it's not uh, everywhere that we can use electricity directly. There needs to be transportable fuels. And for that reason, we can produce hydrogen that can be used directly as a hydrogen gas or converted further on to chemical components that can be used as fuel. So um, what is new is that the need has increased a lot due to the climate change and also that uh, many companies have uh, um, developed technology that is more mature than it was earlier. But how difficult is, like your company is a hydropower company, your DNA is hydropower. And uh, I know you are in other uh, renewable sources, but uh, switching to, to hydrogen, is kind of part, you know, trying to acquire new DNA. So as the CEO of the company, I mean, are you struggling with this kind of, you know, adding DNA, uh, hydrogen to your DNA? Or you think this transition is as smooth as some people think? Uh, this, is, uh, this is easy as a concept, difficult on an industrial scale. The technology to split water into hydrogen and oxygen has been known for more than 100 years and has been also utilized into industrial processes many, many times. So the technology is well known, but uh, what we need to do now is to, to deploy it at uh, an enormous scale compared to what has been going on so far. And that is a huge challenge. But um, there is, there is uh, probably... Uh, uh, not a way uh, to solve the climate crisis without adding quite a significant part of uh, hydrogen into the energy mix of the future. So uh, I think it's possible. I think it will be done. We have the technology, but there is a large challenge, both industrially and financially, and also commercially, to get it into the market. So this is not easy. No, not easy. Good. I mean, so taking actually a thread from your words that is not really easy. But still, I find the world over, go to any capital, energy capital, everybody is talking of uh, hydrogen. And there are some people, and that actually includes me also. I mean, this, this seems to be a little of, a bit of hype. There's too much talk about hydrogen. Every second day, there is a conference happening in our part of the world also on hydrogen. And uh, so there is hype, there is this kind of, uh, you know, drama being created around hydrogen as if hydrogen is like antibiotic is going to basically, you know, solve every single need of every single society in terms of, you know, energy. Is that the case? I mean, it's too much hype. My, if you go by history, whenever you create too much hype about anything, 
the results are very often quite the opposite. Are you worried uh, about the uh, type which is being created? I think you are both right and wrong at the same time here. It, one, you are wrong in saying it is a hype, but uh, you are questioning whether it's just a bubble or not. I think it has similarities with the digital technology. Uh, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, there was a lot talk about uh, digitalization, the Y2K, the, 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 uh, there was a technology hype in a way uh, around the digital solutions. So uh, we saw companies increasing in value and uh, decline again. But what happened was there was a lot of digitalization coming out of this, although not all companies were successful. And as of today, digital technology is into everything. Uh, so it was a hype, but it became big. I think uh, it is a bit of the same with hydrogen. We, hydrogen is a natural part of all fuels, as I just mentioned it. Uh, it, it the dominant fuel in the world is hydrocarbons, and, uh, uh, and, and hydrogen is, uh, is the dominant part of those fuels. So we need new fuels. We, we need electricity to be used in as many applications as possible when it is produced from non-emitting sources, but we also need transportable fuels. So um, there will be a parallel development, I think, in many countries at the same time, a little bit like we have seen with the digital technology. It will be interlinked with the exchange system of fuels, but uh, other fuels than we have today. I think uh, pure hydrogen and ammonia will be two important fuels of the future, and uh, oil and gas and coal will decline. But there will still be fuels, and they will be produced in a new way, and uh, uh, it, it will have to, to be uh, in such uh, industrial setup that we don't have the climate emissions when producing the hydrogen and um, the derived fuels uh, coming from hydrogen. Well, very interesting take. In fact, I love your analogy. You are comparing it with data. But you see, uh, when in digital technology, and of course, we have all seen the results, how it has completely transformed our daily life, our daily business, and in a way, the landscape, business landscape, the social landscape across the world. Uh, but when you look at hydrogen, of course, hype and all that, okay, that's one aspect. But the other aspect is it has been kind of, you know, on the front page for now three, four years. But when you look at what has happened on the ground, then actually you don't get to see much. I mean, it costs much more to produce the amount of hydrogen which is being used, for instance, in Norway, you are energy rich country. So probably you can have a very different take when it comes to hydrogen. But the majority of countries in the world, including India and China and Indonesia and many others in, in the world, they're not energy rich, they're, they're energy deficit countries. So they probably uh, need to kind of be extremely careful in the sense, because if it costs you more to produce hydrogen, then the, hydro then the overall economics of the hydrogen can be extremely challenging. Are you still optimistic? Do you think over a period of time, the cost of producing hydrogen will come down and it will be, the economics will become very attractive for practically every country, whether you're energy rich or you're not? Yes, I am optimistic. And the reason is uh, to fight the climate change, we need other sources of energy than those emitting uh, climate gases. We need to take down uh, the consumption of coal and oil and gas massively. But we still need energy. We need homes that have a temperature that is pleasant. We need transport. We need industry. There is a huge need of energy. That need will not go away. It could be a bit more efficient than today, but it will still be there. So we need new types of energy. And, uh, on that logic, hydrogen and hydrogen-derived fuels are very competitive. They are not cheaper than to burn coal, but we have to stop burning the amounts that we do today. Uh, there will still be a need for some hydrocarbons also in the future, but much, much less than today, and we need to get the whole world to net zero. So, um, what happens now is that there are uh, developments on small scale many places in the world at the same time. This is uh, probably the start of an exponential growth. Exponential growth looks very, very small in the first years. So you can hardly observe it. But uh, th then it comes in large scale. It was like mobile telephones. 
there, there were a few people using them and they were very expensive. We were asking, do we really need these uh, devices? Well, we all know what happened. So uh, what is likely here is that the battery technology to store uh, electricity and hydrogen as a basis for fuels of the future will have an exponential growth. Batteries is a bit uh, earlier, uh, it's visible now. It's, it's coming into cars everywhere. Hydrogen will be visible some years from now, going into fuels everywhere. And the good thing is that all countries in the world have either wind or sun, or both in large quantities. And uh, electricity can be made from wind and sun, and electricity can be converted into hydrogen. So this new technology is not only good for the climate, it's also making every nation in the world and every, every neighborhood in the world able to produce their own fuels from sun and wind. Also, uh, several places have hydropower, which can be used as well, like Norway and like the northern part and mid part of India. But, 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 but the, the fact that all nations can produce their own fuel is also uh, a driver in its own right. Well, interesting, very interesting uh, um, uh, observation. But Christian, when you look at the reality, I mean, uh, in Europe, in which countries, uh, you talk more about energy transition, and uh, zero emissions and all that than we do in India, though our commitment and our track record is, is, is very good. Uh, but my point is that, you know, when you look at energy transition, basically renewables replacing fossil fuels, including coal, but when you look at it on the ground, is that really, is renewable replacing oil anywhere in the world? Is renewable replacing coal anywhere in the world? Is a re renewable replacing uh, natural gas anywhere? That's not happening. Renewable is just coming as a kind of addition to what already exists. So, which means the energy transition is not really happening in the sense um, renewables are not replacing anything. In country like India, for instance, 80%, more than 80% of energy is still come from fossil fuel. And I don't really see that changing anytime fast Be uh, because there are 3 billion energy poor on the planet. There are 1 billion energy poor in my country. When I say energy poor, I mean they have access to electricity, but very small quantity. They, either they can't afford or it's just not available. So across the world, there are 3 billion people. They need energy tomorrow morning. They can't wait for major breakthrough in, energy, uh, in hydrogen economy. I mean, uh, I, I admire, and there's a, in the view that you Take, for instance, from Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, Norway, Canada, even the United States. But when you look at the world from New Delhi or Jakarta or Dhaka or, or Nigeria or Angola, the world looks quite different. Uh, I mean, as, as, a, as, a, as a company, you are a very reputed company, and Norway is, a, is an important energy leader in the world. Uh, and you are also among the richest countries in the world. I mean, when you look at the globe, uh, how, how optimistic you are on energy transition, especially when you look at the reality that countries like India are going to use coal, come what may, for the next 20 years, if not more than that. And there are many others who are going to do exactly the same. We have seen energy price and market energy crisis in Europe. We are seeing over Russia, Ukraine, and so on and so forth. So my question to you is just this, as a leader, industry leader, and as a Norwegian, and as a, you know, this, are, aren't there too many challenges in this talk about zero emission in a very smooth way or to talk about transition as if it's like an expressway in Germany, things can move very fast, swiftly, like you move on butter. Or you think, actually, it's not that easy, it's challenging. It, it is already a transition going on in Europe when it comes to replacing coal with renewable energy. Uh, coal capacity uh, is being taken down now in several European countries. And uh, uh, also going forward, the growth in Europe will be dominantly led by renewables when it comes to new electricity. Uh, in India, it's different. India uh, will have to grow uh, energy supply massively, including electricity. So in India, it's mainly talk, uh, the, the main point over the next few decades is um, a transition of the growth 
uh, how can as much as possible of the growth come from not emitting sources. Uh, and in the longer term, there needs to be a replacement of uh, fossil fuel also in India, but it's very different. In Europe, uh, we have a, a, a mature energy system that needs to be changed. In India, uh, the, the key element is to grow it in um, the best way possible with as little emissions as possible. And uh, in the future, we expect globally uh, renewable electricity to constitute 80% of all electricity on the planet, uh, India included. But it will be a higher share in Europe. Europe will be on 90%. Other countries will be less, but still high percent of renewable electricity in the system. And electricity mid-century will constitute about half the energy on the planet. And it will grow further uh, after that. So it, we are talking about the long transition, but uh, it is very important for the world economy what type of new uh, equipment is coming. We expect more or less all cars in the world, uh, mid-century, uh, all new cars to be electric. Uh, we also expect uh, shipping to be low emission, run on renewable fuels, uh, to, on, on all new ships. Old ships um, may run for many years on the fuels they have, but it will be a long transition. But also India will experience this uh, when it comes to what is growing the fastest. And this is similar to what has happened already in the world. We were on sail ships, we went to steam engine, and then we went to combustion engine. It all started somewhere, in, in, uh, and the technology was expensive to begin with. It started with the countries that could pay for this development, but it spread to the whole world. Uh, nowadays, uh, I think India is leading in many aspects, in IT technology, and also uh, has a, a population that is uh, very willing to work and very skilled. So I think some of the development we will see now going forward will also come from India and other places in Asia, of course. We are past the point that there are just a, a few regions in the world that will lead the technology development. It will come from many places and be mixed and we will constantly choose the best. Uh, but it will be transition and the transition in in most of the uh, Asian region and Africa will be a transition of growth. In Europe, it will be a, a transition of the existing. Very good, uh, interesting. Uh, uh, Christian, when, I mean, when you look at Norway and you are a Norwegian company and, uh, and I'm sure you are kind of working on a new feature for your company. Uh, and you look at Norway as a whole, you have a lot of water, you have energy, uh, you also have a, a massive uh, kind of uh, wealth in terms of expertise on maritime technologies and shipping included, and of course, offshore and, uh, and everything. Do you think that Norway has potential to in future emerge like the uh, Saudi Arabia of hydrogen? Because you have everything that you need for that. You have money, you have capital, I mean, you have technology, and you already have a very good name uh, as an energy energy country. So do you think that Norway as a whole has the potential to emerge like Saudi Arabia of hydrogen? And if yes, where do you see, for instance, A, the role and place of your company, Starcraft, in the whole picture? No, I think uh, what we will see when it comes to hydrogen, there will be no Saudi Arabias in the world. It will be produced everywhere, because there is sun and wind that will be converted into electricity, onshore and offshore wind and, and large-scale solar, and also on, on rooftops solar. Uh, that means uh, there will be abundant of renewable electricity everywhere, more or less, and, uh, and that will be converted into hydrogen, uh, a part of this electricity, and therefore uh, further converted into fuels. It will, uh, the reason Saudi Arabia is big in oil is because the oil resources are there. The, the sun and wind is distributed everywhere, so it will be different. But what Norway can do is we can deploy our competence and our capital into these new technologies and make sure that we are playing an important role in the build-up of renewable technology. Uh, but as I said, we will not be the only one. There will be similar development in parallel all around the world. 
but we have a particularly good expertise yeah, in o offshore oil and gas and in shipping, as you said, and also in traditional industries and in renewable and technology of hydropower and wind in particular. So we can use all these skill sets into making sure we are one of the competence center for this in the future. But we are very happy, for instance, with the business we have in India, where we see that we learn also from our Indian colleagues. It's not, uh, it's not a one way, it's, it's learning both ways. So Norway can be a competence center among many, and I'm sure there will be several, not only one in India, but all around India, we will see a bit of the same. What is also new in our time uh, that can speed things up is that we are exchanging knowledge with the speed of light. So uh, what took uh, uh, many, many years earlier to learn from each other, we can do in days now. So uh, uh, one of the good things of our time is that fast communication allows fast transfer of, of uh, the best uh, uh, knowledge of technology and therefore a much more speedy development than we, than we saw when the world went from steamships to combustion engines and so on. Well, thank you very much for this repeated emphasis that you have on that in, 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 uh, you know, going forward, it's not going to be only the rich countries, but countries in the south, developing countries working together to build a better world. I mean, it's, it's coming from you, leader of a very important company in Norway, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's extremely, extremely, uh, you know, hard filling and very good, very optimistic. Please. But just uh, two quick points and before I conclude and the so you basically talking about that hydrogen in a way, if I may, may use the expression, going to kind of energy socialism in the sense that, you know, the divide that you see between the rich country and the poor country, you think hydrogen is going to bridge that gap and even the poorest of the world would have access to sufficient amount of energy thanks to hydrogen and maybe solar. So this kind of going to be a more equitable world in terms of energy, kind of energy, energy socialism, if you don't want to call it energy market. I think energy socialism is a good expression. It, it, it gives us the feeling that it, it will be shared by all of us and it, it will be produced everywhere. And that is the case for renewable energy. But of course, there will still be competition in this world. There will be centers of excellence. So in this big, more energy socialistic world, we still need to cooperate. We need to ensure that we, we, we share our knowledge and uh, jointly uh, do what we can to bring this world forward towards lower emissions and a world uh, that is sustainable. Uh, uh, Christian, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation with you because uh, uh, to me it appears that you kind of you are a kind of you know a combination of a business leader and a leader who is also concerned about the society as a whole and the world as a whole. It's fascinating. It's rare we get to talk with business industry leaders talking more like in such a holistic manner. It has been a fascinating conversation with you. Our audience is going to enjoy it, going to love it. And I hope next year we are able to see you in our conference in person and we will continue with this conversation. Thank you very much and uh, good wishes from India for everything that you are doing as Startup and in your personal life. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Narendra, nice to talk to you as well. And uh, I've been to India many times, so uh, also good to talk to an Indian audience. Thank you. Thank you.